Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's bounty episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre with me as Z. Today, we have a mix of topics, including uh, secure point UTM, uh, change finger bug in uh, the Linux set UID binary, breaking Docker named pipes and more. Um, and yeah, as per usual, the spot the bone solution will be covered on tomorrow's episode, uh, tomorrow's binary episode. And yeah, so we'll jump into our first one here, which is a RCE and uh, unified threat, uh, secure points, unified threat management or UTM firewall. There were actually two phones discovered, um, one of which being the one we'll cover today. There was also uh, another remote info disclosure, which isn't detailed here, but is in another blog post, which we'll cover on tomorrow's episode. So yeah, Z, I'll let you get into that one. Yeah, actually, both of these do have a little bit of a uh, binary spin to the or When I say both of these, the one we'll be covering tomorrow, of course, has a binary aspect to it. And then uh, today's has a little bit. It is at least a weird bug to see on a web application. In this case, there's a firewall. It is using a uh, fast CGI calling out to a C binary. So kind of makes sense. Uh, but talking about the authentication or your login system, for this firewall, um, and this bug does impact both, I guess, the uh, kind of standard user interface and the administrative panel. Um, but basically, you'll log in and kind of have a request up here. Uh, under a normal flow, you, of course, send your credentials, and what you get back is the session, I well, among other things, you'll get back a session ID. Pretty standard fare, I guess, the only... Slightly weird things, not using cookies for this, but sending it back in JSON, but uh, not all that exceptional. So, seems fairly normal, but what they noticed was if you uh, gave incorrect credentials, um, the, not necessarily normal case, but the ideal case is it would return just an empty session ID. Um, but what they found was that if another user had logged in, uh, basically, the session ID that would get returned was just whatever the last real session ID was. So they're basically leaking whatever the last user session ID was every time uh, somebody fails to log in. Uh, it, it's a weird bug to kind of see in the web. This makes me think it's probably something like an uninitialized value, creates a spot for the session ID, and then when the user fails to log in, it never actually fills it in with a value. So it kind of retains whatever value was previously there. So in like a fresh install, or if you were testing the application, just booted it up and tried a bad login, you might see a blank session ID because you know there was nothing there beforehand and maybe initialize that, whatever. Uh, but if somebody had logged in, this is leaking their session ID out. So an attacker could just wait for um, an admin to log in. Uh, do a bad lo or give a invalid login credentials and get the admin session ID or whatever the user. You don't really have a way of knowing what privileges that user has. Uh, you just know that there is a session ID there and that belongs to some user. One of the, I guess, mitigating factors here is that that session ID, well, in, in a lot of cases on the web, session ID is generally sufficient to just take over the account. Toss that usually it's cookies to so toss that in your cookies, and um, you'll just be given access. They do have a little bit of, um, I guess we'll say defense in depth here. Uh, basically, they try and tie the session ID to the user agent and the remote address, uh, which is a fairly especially tying it to the remote address is a reasonably strong mitigation here. Um, User agent, you can probably predict that. Uh, you know, they're probably, they, I think they call out in this post, like, you know, somebody's probably not doing all of the management here from like their mobile browser. You can make some reasonable guesses about uh, the browser in use. The remote address is a little bit more tricky, but um, they do call out if this is NATed. So if you're behind a NAP when you go to reach this, uh, something that's translating the request. When it looks up the address, it is just taking the remote address. There's no following like exported for headers or anything like that. So that will um, that can give you a scenario where multiple users could be like where an attacker could be in a position to have the same IP um, and abuse this. But if they're not, it is kind of challenging. Um, something that they don't really talk about as a potential in this post, but I was thinking as a potential is the way they actually tie the session ID to the 
a user agent and uh, the remote address is through an MD5 hash. They'll create an MD5 hash. They'll write in the... Um, I forget which thing they write first. I'm just trying to find the code here. Uh, yeah, so they write the address in first and then the user agent in second. Um, so given that it is just an MD5, that seems to me like you might be able, if you had some reasonable idea about what IP range somebody would be accessing it from. So if you know, like if this is on a red team engagement, you know, like the admin's probably accessing it from like this client network or whatever, like their IP is going to be based out of this range. Um, you may be able to kind of do an offline attack um, and predict several of what the hashes may be. Um, and so you would just need to find a collision where you control that remote agent um, and find a collision in the MD5 that would match, or that would basically match the MD5 of the proper remote address end. That um, it feels likely to me that you might be able to pull off that sort of attack in the right scenario. And I think it would be a kind of fun attack to manage to pull off. Um, breaking the hash there. Cause I mean, it is just MD5 well known or not very uh, well known to not be very resistant to collisions. You do have the challenge where you don't have the actual hash you want to collide with. So have to do a bit of extra work there, but it feels pretty feasible to me to be able to break that. You could probably side channel it fairly reasonably, like, like timing attack it, you know, but um, it's probably not the path of least resistance is what I'd say. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the bug, uh, I had, I j I jumped to basically the exact same thing. I was like, this is probably like an, un an uninitialized read on the fast CGI side of things. Um, and especially like when you look at the second part uh, that we're going to get into tomorrow, uh, it seems even more likely because I believe that was also an uninitialized use. So, yeah, uh, it's pretty interesting because you generally don't see this kind of mem corruption uh, type issue impacting the web that much. You don't really see that too often, but when it does happen, it's it's fun. So, yeah, and it's a pretty subtle bug to actually notice and to pick out because, um, like, just testing, you know, you fire this up, you test, you don't necessarily realize that the session ID being leaked is something that. Um, because it, it could just be creating like an empty non-user session ID for you. Uh, so like the fact that it's there isn't necessarily a warning sign. So it's not easy to necessarily notice that um, that session ID belongs basically to another user. So it, it's a good spot from whoever found this. Yeah, you have to you have to like uh, go all the way through and, and test pretty thoroughly to confirm that this is actually an issue. It's It's pretty cool. Yeah, like the way I could kind of see it is if I were to have fired this up locally, done some testing, and be like, oh, the session ID is blank when I log in like with an incorrect thing, and then go do a proper login and see what, what it gives me. And then later on, coming back, I'm like, oh, why isn't this blank anymore? And having that, uh, uh, my understanding of the application kind of violated, uh, that's one way I could imagine myself having noticed this, but it is something that I think easily could have been overlooked. Yeah. All right. So up next from Trustwave Spider Labs, we have a change finger or CHFN bug in Linux. Uh, the last time we talked about change finger, finger was on uh, episode 189 when Trail of Bits disclosed the set you would logic bug in the read line library, which was, was used by change finger, um, which they also link off to in this blog post, by the way. Uh, so yeah, CHFN is a fairly interesting target as, you know, where it's able to edit account information and such. Uh, it's a set you would binary and runs as root so they can modify Etsy password. Um, what was of particular interest to them here when they were, you know, looking through change finger was the ability to change the room number field, um, which, you know, is embedded inside of the, uh, the user information line and Etsy password. Um, and when auditing the code relevant for that, they discovered that they apply a blacklist on the room number field to try to determine if it contained non ASCII characters uh, to reject it and prevent you from breaking out of the room number and injecting into Etsy password. Um, so the, the two things that they blacklist, uh, I'm just going to bring it up on screen here. Um, the main things they try to prevent is like uh, a colon, uh, a comma, equal sign, and new line, as well as any non-printable characters. Um, as we usually bring up with blacklisting when covering topics on the podcast, it's generally not a great solution. If we're talking about it, it's probably because it failed to uh, <laughs> to do what was intended. Um, but beyond that, the bigger problem 
uh, is that this... So, yeah, I think I brought it up here. So they have this valid field function. Um, and what they try to do here is uh, it'll it'll return negative one f if you find any illegal characters in the string uh, and a positive one for non ascii characters uh, which you'll notice in their logic when the uh while the invalid room number path for illegal characters exits the non ascii characters just prints and continues on um so that essentially allows you to pass non ascii characters through including carriage returns uh which they are able to use to change account info and Etsy password, you know, reset the character to the start of the line and whatnot. Um, unfortunately, they didn't really get a solid exploit pulled off here um, because it was pretty limited. Uh, you know, they couldn't inject new lines, so they couldn't create new accounts. Um, they also couldn't use colons and such to have proper, like a proper user info line. Um, the way they kind of go about it here is maybe um, combining this with a social engineering attack. Uh, so instead of putting like a colon in there, putting in another uh, Unicode character that looks like a colon. Uh, and then, you know, their idea is maybe you could try to trick a sysadmin into looking at like Etsy password and using that to ver like validate your credentials, even though you don't have any. Um, I don't know. It's a bit of a stretch. I, I don't think it's really... Uh, feasible, to be honest. Um, so it's a bit unfortunate the exploit didn't really work out. That said, I still wanted to cover this issue because it is um, a little bit interesting when you have like uh, non ASCII character input being able to go in. Um, you can do some like pretty interesting attacks there, and this uh, this attack with you know using carriage returns, um, it's kind of funny because it bit me recently somewhat. Um, not not so much in like I was being attacked with it, but I was getting strings that I didn't know how to carry its return uh, at the end of them. And it was like completely screwing like everything I was trying to do. It took me like an hour or two to debug it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a fun type of issue to to try to like work with. But unfortunately, you know, while the blacklist wasn't sufficient enough to prevent you from breaking out, it was sufficient enough to prevent you from doing anything, uh, you know, super impactful with it. So. Yeah, it's it's definitely unfortunate that they couldn't take this to some sort of more meaningful exploit. I do think the idea of, you know, social engineering the sysadmin into reading the Etsy password file and being like, oh, yeah, you should totally be rude. Like, that feels pretty unlikely to me. Um, there's almost certainly some better process in place for that. Um, or, you know, pretending that you got hacked or something like there's maybe some potential there. On a whole, like, yeah, I don't see much impact to this bug, but it is an interesting bug just in the fact, um, like, the root cause with the error numbers being returned, the uh, one versus minus one aspect, you know, in this case, this didn't turn out to be much, but that is something to kind of pay attention to when you do have, um, not just with error codes, but the change in return value that's kind of unexpected. So it does feel a little bit weird to, um, switch the sign out for uh, that warning, I guess. I, effectively, what they're doing is saying, you know, if, if it's greater than zero, it's a warning. If it's less than, it's an error. But um, it, it is something to take note of and kind of look for. Unfortunately, it's a fairly common, like, anti-pattern. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, in this case, not much you can do with it, but... You know, this sort of bug can definitely creep up elsewhere, and it's something to be aware of. Like, in this case, they are taking advantage of the structure of their kind of target file, of uh, being aware of, you know, what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to look like, and trying to break assumptions at that level, uh, which is something that in a lot of web app testing, I mean, a lot of people just kind of leave as, well, you know, I broke out of the quotes and injected JavaScript or whatever, and have this very clear-cut thing, whereas this is a lot more... I guess blurry if a line that you're crossing. Um, there's a lot more wiggle room to kind of come up with creative attacks in this sort of scenario. So yeah. it just feels like something that's worth calling out, even though this particular exploit wasn't wasn't that meaningful. All right, so uh, Simlink style attacks are back in the news with CyberArk's posts on Bones and Docker desktop for Windows, including multiple arbitrary file delete and arbitrary file overwrite bugs, um, though they're both kind of tied together uh, on all of them. So, yeah, um, two areas were of main interest here that they investigated, being the Windows container uh, controller and the Hyper-V controller. Uh, so starting off with the Windows container controller, 
there were two methods that they took note of, uh, start and stop, which allows low privilege users to start and stop the Docker daemon. Um, and the start function would take this Windows container start request object's input, which is user controlled. Uh, and among these fields, they noticed the daemon JSON field. Um, and what that essentially is, it's it's for passing a path to the config file for Docker to use. Um, and, you know, especially when you're talking about config files, you have more complex parsing going on. You, you have more, uh, it, it's a pretty interesting attack service to look at. So when they looked at the daemon JSON file, uh, there were two fields they like narrowed in on, um, one of which was the data root field, which is where the first uh, vulnerability comes into play. Um, so data root is used for passing a path of where uh, to a directory that contains like container resources. Um, and if that directory doesn't exist, Docker will create it under system uh, and it'll write file there system. If it's already created, though, it'll just write file there system. So you can kind of see where this is going, probably. Um, if you create the directory beforehand as a you know unprivileged user, um, you can maintain access and have it write uh, files there as system there. And you can basically race the daemon to change that directory to a symlinked one to get a privileged right anywhere. Um, the second field of interest was one the thing, PID file. Uh, one ahead. thing I want to call out here is when we're talking about symlinks, um, it, it's been a while since we've talked about these sorts of attacks. For a while, we were covering them on almost every episode, so we kind of dropped it. But um, this is taking advantage of a trick. I believe it was something that uh, James Forshaw uh, came out with. Uh, I guess it's been several years now. But, he, um, he popularized it on Windows, yeah. Yeah, because like symlink attacks are, you know, well known on the Linux, but it's a little bit more tricky on the Windows side. So if you're like, how are you doing symlinks as this unprivileged user? There is kind of a technique for it. I'd recommend just looking up. I think the talk was something like a link through time. Um, but it's from James Forshaw. If you do like James Forshaw symlink, you'll almost certainly come across information about kind of how you do these symlink attacks on Windows as an unprivileged user. Yeah, good show. Um, so yeah, the second field of interest was the PID file, which basically had the same problem. Um, when the daemon started and executed that start method, it would create the file and on stop it would delete it. Uh, and so by using the start and stop methods uh, and sim linking for the PID file path, um, you could get arbitrary file overwrite and file delete respectively. Uh, they could take the file delete to privilege escalation via using the config.msi directory for the Windows installer, which is a known technique they link off to ZDI for. They don't really go into much detail in this post. Um, I don't remember if we covered it at, at the time that was published. I meant to look into that, but I forgot. Um, but basically, the idea there is uh, the Windows installer has a rollback functionality, which will store rollback scripts in this config.msi directory on the C drive in case it needs to restore files back to their original state. Uh, and so if you can delete that directory and create it yourself, um, you can get control over those rollback scripts and make arbitrary system changes. Um, so basically, there was some tricks. They could do the symlink style attack again, pass some benign PID file, uh, make a junction to you know the config.msi directory. Um, on Windows 10, they weren't able to get that to work um, because the directory had to be empty to delete it. Um, and there were files there with like a random ID attached to it. Um, they say that they could have tried to brute force the names to try to delete all the files as there were only like eight hex character names or whatever. So it's not like it would be impossible to brute force. Um, but instead for the, and like all intents and purposes of the blog post, they just checked on Windows 11 and Windows 11 didn't have the config.msi directory. So it worked there without any added steps. So yeah, um, not that it would be impossible to exploit on Windows 10, but I, I figured I'd point that out. Um, there were also some other issues in the Hyper-V controller. Uh, again, I'm not going to iterate on it too much because they're basically the same style of issue. Um, they had similar problems in the create and destroy methods. Destroy had a problem where it would take a disk path, which again could be attacker controlled from that input object um, and and delete like destroy would delete it uh, again, vulnerable to the sim link where you could just delete an arbitrary file and create had the same issue in reverse. Um, it would create this Docker desktop uh, virtual hard disk file uh, based on the data path, which could be attacker controlled. So yeah, um, basically just a lot of variants of the same sort of bug. Um, they just don't really check for, you know, junctions or, or sim links on any of these paths that they parse. Um, so yeah. And it's, yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, that's that's basically all there is to it. There isn't uh, there isn't too much complicated there. So four CVEs were handed out, um, but yeah, pretty much all of them, like the arbitrary file delete and arbitrary file overwrite, uh, were just two different ways of taking advantage of the same issues. So, yeah, and honestly, I, they're fun attacks. I do like seeing these symlink issues. They're pretty easy to kind of follow as long as you're familiar with the symlink and stuff. And I did add a link in the notes to uh, Project Zero Post. I guess that does go back to 2015, so it, it's a little bit older than I was uh, I was thinking it was. But um, but yeah, I've I mean, been flying lately. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it, still, it's a fun set of attacks, and we haven't talked about these in a pretty fair while. So I I think we stopped talking about these attacks. Uh, back when we were like before we even did the split to, uh, from bounty and binary episodes. So it's been yeah. quite a while since we've covered these sort of uh, junction attacks or symlink attacks. Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit uh, off topic, but it's kind of funny because I was talking with someone uh, on Discord about this. But in the security space, like it's super common to see trends take off where it's like, uh, you know, a few different researchers or whatever are looking into like one class of issue and then other people notice that and take inspiration from it. And it it kind of like snowballs and you end up with a lot of posts finding uh, similar issues and different products. So, yeah, there was one point in time, like whenever that was that you mentioned that we were just covering <laughs> these like style issues multiple times every week. Uh, and it got to the point where we're like, yeah, it feels like we're... <laughs> We're repeating ourselves too much, so we'll just drop these kinds of topics. But yeah, it's been a while since we picked up uh, from that. So yeah, and uh, it, it's nice to see it to see kind it. of pop up again because, like I said, it is a fun like attack that you know you're taking advantage of some very kind of logical issues, um, which I'm always kind of a fan of seeing those sorts of things. So I, I did find it interesting that on Windows here that the user could have control over the daemon json file like just point and be like yep this is it this is what to use it, it kind of makes sense because you can do like a low privilege docker instance uh have it running as the user so like fair i just haven't really considered that as like possibility i guess um so i thought that was a little bit interesting uh yeah it yeah. seems like a necessary evil in the form of attack surface that's that's the way i looked at it so yeah. So continuing on with uh, the idea of these log more logical type issues, um, next from Orca Security, we have an Azure uh, storage account keys privesque. And yeah, Z, I'll let you take this one away. Yeah, and this is purely on the privesque side. It is assuming you already have some degree of access, uh, some degree of control. And um, effectively, this one is based around the it's the list keys. Uh, so with storage accounts, um, create a storage account. By default, what Microsoft will do is it will create these uh, storage account keys. And these two keys, a couple 512-bit keys for whatever. Um, I'm just trying to find where they talk about the actual keys in here. But um, effectively, these keys are how you can authenticate and actually access uh, the data being held by the storage account. So create the storage account. It has these couple keys that are like your root or like complete access to all of their data. And that exists by default, but their recommendation is that you should disable this. So like they recommend you use Azure AD to do all the authentication and don't have these keys, but by default, they generate you the keys and leave them there, uh, which Kind of leaves you in this scenario where with this list keys permission, if you end up compromising something that has list keys, um, somebody who's setting up kind of their cloud environment and deciding what roles, whatever's going to take, like they could have something have this role that looks like it's just a read-only role. Um, it has no access to the data plane, it has no access to like modify the data, but it does have this read access to list the keys. Um, and all they're really calling out here is the fact that if you do have list keys. Uh, there's a pretty good chance you can take that uh, through to code execution uh, by going with list keys. Uh, when you create an Azure function, so that's you know, cloud functions, um, it'll create a dedicated storage account for it. Presumably, those are likely going to have these couple keys stored alongside of it. So you would be able to take your list keys, get access to the functions key, um, and then change the source code for the function, check what you want. 
uh, Exfil, uh, change the code to Exfil, whatever uh, kind of sense of information is within that function or tokens that it has and can escalate from there. So this is just a privess going from, hey, with list keys, you can actually compromise all of the storage under that, despite not having any storage access on that same account. Um, so it's worth kind of calling out that it's there. It is just this privess. Just if you're in that scenario, something to be mindful of, something to keep in mind, but it is a design choice. It is how Microsoft chose to design this. It's not not as much of a vulnerability that they can go and fix. It's just they needed some way, like if you don't want to run Active Directory, you still need some way to do auth. This is how they've got it. It just happens to have these other sort of considerations that's worth being aware of. Uh, on a similar note, I'm just going to jump right into the uh, next topic here, which is with uh, Predilex vulnerabilities. They have a couple of vulnerabilities, but what I thought was more interesting here was, again, the privilege escalation aspect. Uh, taking a limited file write, um, and we've talked a little bit about other privilege escalations from this, but taking a limited file write, how do you turn that into code execution? In this case, if you do have control over the file extension, so you have to be able to write a .pth file, uh, and you need to be able to write that any more or less anywhere you want, you need to write into a particular directory, but all it requires is controlling the start of a line, and you'll be able to get code execution in some Python environments. Uh, the way they leverage it is through uh, the site-specific configuration hooks, or um, in your home folder, the doth local, lib, Python, you know, three point whatever, uh, kind of the subfolder there, site packages. Inside of that folder, if you write one of these PTH files, it'll basically scan all of those files um, and just look for, does the line start with import? Import space or import tab. If it does, it'll take that line and it'll execute it as Python. If it doesn't, it'll ignore that line. So you can have a very um, messy write as long as you can get control over some of the content and control the start of a line, you'd be able to get a Python code execution uh, through that, right? So just a trick worth kind of being aware of if you find yourself trying to take one of these file writes and try and get code execution. No one of the other common things is go for the uh, log rotate daemons, kind of the one trick uh, I've used quite a bit where you can write one of those, or uh, write one of the configuration files and you can get code execution off that. There's a variety of tricks for it. This is just another one that was at least new to me. So I figured I would call it out here. Yeah, uh, on a like meta level note, the uh, Predilex post was kind of cool too because it like Predilex for those who aren't aware of what it is, and I wasn't either until I read this post. Um, it, it's mainly used for conference planning, um, so that's why the name of the post is "How to Get Accepted at Every Conference." Is because a lot of conferences like Offensive Con, Hexacon, um, and a variety of others uh, use Predilex for you know doing like CFPs and stuff like that. So um, I thought that was kind of a cool aspect to it, like. You know, because we cover like conference stuff uh, a fair a fair bit, and uh, it, it's fun when you see those types of issues impacting you know security focused uh, organizations and stuff. So, yeah, I think I remember seeing one year a talk that was actually about compromising a uh, conference scheduler like that, like that was also handling the CFPs and stuff. Um, it, it wasn't Predilex, I don't think, but. I do remember seeing a talk about that. It kind of leaves you wondering, well, did they actually get accepted or just use this to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it adds some fun spice to the, uh, to the talk. Um, but yeah, on the impact side of things, like they kind of mentioned here, and I didn't really think about this too much before, but it is a fair call out. Um, beyond the more you know fun aspects of it, like uh, being able to you know submit a, like accept your own conference talk, essentially. Um, you know, there is also some sensitive information potentially being submitted in these CFPs, especially for ones that don't get accepted, and then maybe you back out and don't do it or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, there there could be some interesting information in the CFP uh, from a tech, like some good technical information, um, I'll say. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting impact. I don't know. It's just something I noticed. Um, but yeah, the vulnerabilities seemed fairly... Uh, you know, standard and, and not really noteworthy beyond the Privesque uh, aspect of it. Um, and jumping back a little bit with the Azure topic, um, 
it was kind of funny seeing that this was another one of those issues that Microsoft acknowledged, but you know, they said they couldn't really fix it. It's kind of a design thing. It would take a lot of effort and, and work to, you know, redesign it so that this wouldn't be exploitable. Um, Cause we talked about an AWS issue that was like very similar to this, where it was like, I wish I remember the specifics of it. Um, I should have went back and, and got notes on it, but yeah, we had an AWS issue, which was the same sort of authentication bypass uh, or like prevesc type issue. Um, I think you could like use a token to, uh, you know, derive and are you thinking unwrap. of the EKS one where it might be the EKS one uh, exchange? Um, th- so that was the escalation path where you start off by compromising the pod. You exchange the pod, use the pod, hit the metadata service to get the ECS. Then you right. exchange yeah. that back with EKS uh, to turn your AWS identity into the EKS, EKS identity or token. And then you can wait for something privileged to happen on your node. Yeah, so that was something where it was a pretty impactful like attack and like a useful attack chain to know about. Um, but you know, Amazon couldn't really change that because it was a, a necessary evil in their design decision. They couldn't really go back on it. Um, so yeah, it's it's funny to see that in the cloud. It seems to be something you see in the cloud more than other spaces where um, these design type issues, like it's just so hard to design the cloud in a secure way. Um, especially when you have like these complicated permission models. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in this case, um, it's kind of I, I, I'm trying to kind of set some of my thoughts in order, but I I do agree with you that it, it's hard to solve these. Uh, in some cases, like there's always, or in most cases, there's always going to be trade-offs uh, with whatever decisions you make. Like they could force everybody to just use Active Directory and, you know, do it the secure way. But a lot of people just don't want to run Active Directory. So they have this, alternative that is a little bit or that is significantly less secure it, it's a challenge um when it ca- comes to the kubernetes one and the aws issue like that one they're also kind of dependent on kubernetes design a little bit there and you know that root cause was just like after they have a metadata service like they can't really conceivably change that too easily um, like th- there are these very fundamental things, so it's really, uh, you know, they're privas. Um, and as for why it doesn't really show up elsewhere outside of the cloud, I think it's more because then we would just call it an exploit chain. Like we just look at it very differently because the cloud is widespread and shared by a number of people. Whereas if we were talking about that exact same, like I'll use the AWS issue because I think it's a little bit more of a concrete thing. Um. In a lot of other cases, we would just talk about that. It's like, this is how they escalate in this case, because it would be so specific to their particular application. It's just because of the cloud. We have things that are just more widely used. That's fair. It just comes with the territory being more centralized. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, fair point. But yeah, um, I believe that's most of the topics that we have for this week. I know you have a shout out, Z, so I'll let you get into that, and then we'll wrap up the show. Yeah, I had one shout out here, uh, which is this large language models hackers handbook or LLM hackers handbook. I thought it looked interesting. I have not read all of it, but both like the uh, prompt injections techniques there, things to consider. Worth giving a read as more applications are trying to uh, integrate GBT3. I think they use for all their examples here, they're using the GBT. 3.5 tur- turbo model. Um, but effectively, they're using GBT 3.5, um, which a lot of places are s- starting to try and integrate. So worth looking at as prop injection on the offensive side, a little bit on the defensive side too, which I actually do uh, take a look at uh, because a lot of this seems really hard to defend against. Uh, but yeah, just something to take a look at. Um like I said, I haven't given it a full read, so I can't say it's like this great resource, but it seems pretty solid at a glance. Yeah, I think we've seen maybe one or two topics that touch on, uh, you know, like GPT 
um, being used for some application and it being vulnerable because of it. Um, and I think we kind of said at the time that it seems basically impossible to integrate with uh, like these machine learning models uh, in a way that's secure to as like if you basically have to only accept trusted input into them uh, is the way I kind of look at it. But um, yeah, this is just even more. It seems like it's just even more research into that area. Um, well, we I don't. Think... I don't think we'll be covering it too much on the show, but still, it's it's an, an active area of research is developing. So, yeah, when it comes to integrating with it, I think the big thing is trying to integrate with it in a way where you have expected data output. Um, the integrations that are like, uh, you know, like Bing Chat or something, which, uh, yeah, has its own uh, things going on with it, but uh, own problems. <laughs> yeah, but nonetheless, like it's very open. It's just you type your message, you get whatever it sends back, and like that's the output. It's when you're trying to integrate where it's generating you, like the vulnerabilities we looked at, where like it's generating a code, uh, yeah. like it's you know taking your English and turning it into SQL or something. Like it's where you have that that you also have a lot of chance for the prompt injections to have a reasonable bit of damage. Uh, the reverse prompt injections can happen with the other sort of things, but I do feel like they're not a huge risk. Like, there are no really dangerous secrets being held by uh, the system instructions. I can't imagine these days. I haven't seen it. You hope. Maybe there is, but <laughs> yeah, like, so that sort of thing, at least right now, isn't a huge risk. In the future, I imagine it can be. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to integrations, like, it is fairly easy to do when you're just dealing with text text in text out fine getting anything more complex that's where uh there's a lot of challenges trying to integrate with it uh and where i think there's a lot of potential for its use yeah yeah it kind of goes hand in hand so yeah uh it's fun to look at but yeah not something that uh we'll, we'll probably cover too much uh and you know other topics but yeah um that's pretty much everything that we have for today so unless you have any last minute thoughts see we'll wrap it up Yep, that was my only shout out. All right, cool. So as always, thanks goes out to everyone who tuned in. Uh, recent episodes can be found on Twitch, and all of them are up on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and we're off Anchor. Um, Discord and Twitter links are down below or in the chat for if you want to join the uh, join the community. And yeah, we'll be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific for the binary topics, um, which is also where the Spot the Bone Solution will be covered. And yeah, see you then.